to the celestial city, and before they know it, they have encountered their first difficulty, and they are stuck fast, and they are sinking deeper and deeper into the swamp of despair. Christian, the more he struggles, the deeper he sinks, and the swamp has him stuck fast because of this heavy burden of sin that he's carrying upon his back. Pliable, however, because he's easily influenced and is just along for the ride because he thinks that this is the next thing that will make him happy, doesn't have as much of a problem as Christian because he's not bearing a burden. And so what does Pliable do? He decides he's had enough. This no longer makes him happy. This is not what he signed up for. So he altogether changes his mind and he slogs his way out of the, the, the swamp of despair because he has no burden of his on his back and he's able to do so. And Pliable reminds us of a very important parable that Jesus told us. It's called the parable of the sowers. Now, this is the story where a farmer is broadcasting seed in, in a field. And I just want to take a look at, at one of these characters from the parable of the sower. And here's what happens in Mark chapter 4. Jesus says that some of the seed fell on stony ground where it didn't have much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away and died. What is Jesus talking about? Well, we actually see this happen quite often to people who place their faith in Jesus Christ out of, out of fear of the, their, their existence in the city of destruction, don't want to be there, want to be on their journey to heaven, have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so they make a decision, they make a profession of faith, and then things get hard and they decide, oh, I didn't sign up for this. This isn't working for me. And so Jesus explains the parable then in verse 16. He says, these likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. See, this is typically, uh, there's an emotional experience that goes along with, with this profession of faith and they're immediately relieved and feel like this burden has been lifted off of their shoulders, but it's short-lived because verse 17, they have no root in themselves. And so they endure only for a short time. And afterward, when tribulation or persecution, the swamp of despair, arises for the world's sake, immediately they stumble. They stumble. See, adversity reveals your faith's veracity. Adversity reveals your faith's veracity. The word veracity means to discern whether or not something is really genuine, whether it's really real. And nothing will reveal whether your faith is real or not like your response to adversity. Well, back to our story in the, the swamp of, of despair, along comes a man named Help because Christian desperately needs help. He cannot save himself. And in the Pilgrim's Progress, Help represents the Holy Spirit who is always present to help us in our time of need. And so Help lifts Christian up out of the swamp of despair. Pliable, however, he had already clawed his way out of the swamp and is on his way back to the city of destruction, and we never hear from Pliable again. Now, no sooner had Christian even dried off than he encounters a man named Worldly Wise Man. Worldly Wise Man simply represents the worldly wisdom of this world, and Christian now is faced with a choice. Because Mr. Worldly Wiseman discerns that Christian is on the journey to the celestial city, sees that he has a book, and Christian tells him, you know, I, I'm on my way to the celestial city, um, and, and Worldly Wiseman says to him, yeah, but you, you, you can't go that way. This is that, what, what you're pursuing is not all it's cracked up to be, and that book of yours, ah, you really shouldn't listen to that. You're not going to be happy following that book. In fact, there's a better way. That burden that you're carrying on your back, there's actually a shorter path. There's an easier path to get that thing off of your back. Come with me. Let's go this way. And oh my goodness, what a, what a bad decision that proves to be. Because every time you follow worldly wisdom, it always ends in regret. Everyone thinks that they're going to be the exception, but nobody is. And that proves to be true in Christian's case as well. 
And so as worldly wisdom points this, to out this new path to Christian, Christian sets out on his journey in that direction, and he ends up at the base of a terrifying mountain, maybe like a volcano, because there is fire and brimstone raining down on Christian, and he is terrified, and he regrets that he ever listened to the words of Mr. Worldly Wiseman. And that's a lot like life. That's a lot like our journey as Christians. Where we get off of God's path, we stop listening to his book. We take matters into our own hands and we chart a new course for our life. We do what we want and we listen to the, the world's wisdom. And where does that end? Never anywhere good. And it can be an awfully terrifying place to be. Well, evangelist gets word that Christian is in terrible danger. And so he comes to the rescue and he, he pulls Christian aside and he says, Christian, wh how in the world did you end up here? And Christian says to him, I know, I, I, I should have never listened to worldly wise men. I, I'm so sorry that I, that I ever did. And so Evangelist reminds him, look, you, you have that book. You've, you've got your Bible. Stay on the straight and narrow. Follow your book. And boy, what a, what a message that is to all of us who claim the name of Christ. Christian's book is the Bible. And that book serves as Christian's map that's going to see him through all the way to the celestial city, and all he has to do is follow it. So I'm going to need, uh, I'm gonna need a couple children. All right, we already have volunteers. All right. So I'm looking for kids who are maybe like third grade and under. Um, yep, Simeon Calderon, I see that hand. Come on up. He actually didn't raise his hand. <laughs> Anna Dawson, come on up. And we have, yeah, Kenty, come on up here. All right. Oh, that's okay. Hey, you, you just want to... You just won a baseball championship, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Yeah, you, you 10. I saw you in the newspaper. That's fantastic. All right, so come around the map. Come on over here. You got to get close so that you can see. I need you real close because you need to be able to see the details of this map. All right? And I want you to be able to see the details of the map. I just blew up just a small section of this. Now, I need you guys to tell me. We'll start with Anna. Go ahead and look, look closely at this map. And just, just tell us what you see. I see rivers. Oh, rivers. Man, she's like way ahead of the curve because the map shows there's a lot of blue and there's a lot of what other color? Yellow and red. Yeah, and green, right? And so if the blue is water, then Kenty, what do you think the green is? Land. Land. Yeah, and these dark green sections, do you know what those are? Woods. Woods. The whole green is actually woods. Those dark green sections, those are swamps. Okay, Simeon, you got to look really close. Tell me what else you see that they haven't said yet. Um. <laughs> is this confusing? Kind of. Yeah. This is it like trails and roads? Trails, yes, exactly. Do you see any little black triangles? Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to get really close. You see them down there? What, yeah. Any guesses? Cities? Cities. Those are actually campsites. Those are places that you can camp. How about this little green splotch right in the middle of the blue? What do you think that is? An island. That is an island. Good. All right. Thank you guys so much for helping me. So I blew up a section of this map because I want, I want to make some observations about this because this is so much like the Word of God. As you look at this, when I first put it up on the screen, th this is like, what in the world? You're trying to get your bearings and not even understand what you're looking at. Just a small section of the map, but it's overwhelming. There's a lot going on here. And oftentimes when you first open your Bible and you're just getting started on this Christian journey, isn't that kind of how the Bible feels? That's how it felt to me. But lo and behold, you begin using your map 
and you begin living life there. See, this is a place that I've actually, I've lived here. I've spent time here. In fact, the route that you see that's handwritten in red there with a the dotted line, that's actually uh, the route of the last wilderness trip that I took with a group of teenagers from our church years ago. And this was, this was our path. These, these are the places that we went. And in fact, you'll see that uh, up at the top, there's something called Blueberry Island. And that's just a name that we, we gave it. And we spent two days there. And oh my goodness, if you only knew the memories that came out of Blueberry Island. I mean, the, the cliff jumping and eating fish and I, what else did we eat? I don't know, I think kids were eating slugs and little clammy mussel things and all kinds of gross stuff that kids will do when you get it. It was amazing, it was awesome, and we had the time of our lives. There was even a, a great big storm uh, one time when I was, was up there where uh, trees, a, a tree had literally fallen in between a couple of our tents. We had, there were branches crashing down. This was like the only place that I've ever seen in this park where there's actually an outhouse. Normally you get to use the treasure chest. I'm not going to go into detail what a treasure chest is. You just use your imagination. But even the outhouse blew over, and that was no fun putting that back in, in place. But see, this is a place that I've spent time, and I have memories of this place. And as I look at my Bible, I see the very same thing. A place where the Word of God has intersected with my life for a period of time and has helped me to navigate through that period of life. And so as I look through the pages of, of my Bible, there's a path here. There's, there's a way. There is, there is life change. There are memories that I associate with the words on this page. Is that true for you? See, that's what God has designed your Bible to be for you. And I, I hope that it is. And if it's not yet... Man, it's never too late to get started. And don't be worried if at first it looks like that to you and it's scary. Just spend time in it and it'll come and God will show you the, the way. See, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Here's what that means, okay, in map language, okay? Doctrine is what shows you the path, shows you what to believe, it shows you how, how to live. That sets the course for your life, shows you the path. Re uh, reproof tells you when you have strayed off the path. Correction helps you get back on the path, and instruction or training in righteousness helps you to stay on the path. The Bible's our map for life. And you know, not having a map can be awfully discouraging. One of the things that we do on these wilderness trips in Algonquin Provincial Park in Canada is we give the map to just one leader for the day. Nobody else is allowed to look at the map. And I'll tell you what, that can be a frustratingly discouraging position to be because you just have to trust the leader. And you really don't know where you're going. Have you ever felt that way in life? Without direction, without a map. So let me ask you this question this morning. What discourages you? What's discouraging you as you came into church this morning? What's discouraging you as you view online? We're all carrying discouragement. What, what is that discouragement? What's the first thing that popped into your mind? Okay, well, what do, we, what do we know? What we know for sure is that God has given us a map through the swamp of despair. God has given us a map to handle discouragement, to make our way through discouragement. Okay, if that's what we know, what do we do? What do we do? Well, we're going to look at what Psalm chapter 40 says because, interestingly enough, the psalmist David spent time in the swamp of despair and he has, a, he has a map all laid out for us. Because he's been there, he can show us the way through it. So if you brought your Bibles this morning, turn there. If you didn't bring a Bible, you might be able to find one in the seat underneath you. I'm not going to show the verses on the screen because I really want to encourage you to bring a Bible with you so that you can see this for yourself. If there's not one under your seat, maybe you can look on with your neighbor. 
And what we're going to talk about is how to defeat discouragement. The way that you dis defeat discouragement, what we see from the Psalms, in particular Psalm chapter 40, is you defeat discouragement with a steadfast heart. You've got to have a steadfast heart if you have any chance of defeating discouragement. Psalm chapter 57, uh, verse 7 says, My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises. So let's pray for that right now before we read God's word. Father, we're tremendously thankful for the map that you've laid out for us, the, the path that you have charted through the swamp of despair. Thank you that you make available to us the ability to make our hearts steadfast if we would just follow your map. And we can face any discouragement when you empower us to do so. So, Father, we're depending upon you to give us exactly what we need in our season of discouragement right now, no matter what that discouragement may be for any individual here. God, that you would meet them right where they are in that particular swamp and that you would give them the help that they need. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm chapter 40. All right, here we go. The first way that we defeat discouragement and we develop a steadfast heart that can defeat discouragement is we have to remain prayerful and patient. Remain prayerful and patient. Where does that come from? Verse 1 in the text where David says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me. See, it got his attention. God's responding here. And he heard my cry. Two things in the text here. Patience and prayer. And I'll tell you what, we live such a hurried, frenetic pace of life, we don't often implement these things, especially when we're discouraged. We think that we've got, we've got to muster up enough strength and enough gumption to just keep going, just keep moving, make things happen, and we want to control the outcomes. And the psalmist here says, hold on, not in the swamp of despair. When you are discouraged, that is the last time that you should be making uh, significant decisions in your life. He says, hold on, just pump the brakes for just a minute, slow down, let's be prayerful about this, and let's be patient until the Lord brings some clarity. Okay, number two, you have to repent of your sin. If you're going to develop a steadfast heart that can defeat discouragement, and you're going to navigate your way through the swamp of, of despair, you've got to evaluate your heart. Is there sin that's actually discouraging you? Is that the root of where that discouragement's coming from? Look at verse 2. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. Okay, that's like the city of destruction, the, the, the swamp of despair. This is, this is a bad place to be in. Well, how do we know this has anything to do with sin? Well, this is poetic imagery, okay? Just like the Pilgrim's Progress gives us poetic imagery, so the psalmist does too. And look what happens. There's a dramatic turn here. There's a shift where he says, he brings me up out of this, this terrible bog, and it, he sets my feet upon a rock, and he establishes my steps. Now, the way that we know that this has to do with some type of swamp of sin that David ends up regretting and repenting from is because you look at, over at verse 12, and he fills in some more color here, where he says, For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me. See, he's drowning in the swamp of his sin so that I am not able to even look up, and they are more than the hairs of my head, and therefore my heart fails me. See, he's lost a steadfast heart. He's dying, he's drowning in this. So what does he have to do? He has to repent of his sin. Now the turning point in, in verse 2 where he comes up out of the miry clay, who's the one doing the action? Is it David who clambered up out of the swamp? Nope, it's not. Help came. God saved him from his sin. God gave him the gift of repentance. Here's what scripture says, that repentance is a gift. But not only is it, is it a gift, it's a gift that is to be received and acted upon. And so our responsibility as, as believers is to say, okay, enough of this. I am, I am done with this quagmire of sin that I've gotten myself into. I'm forsaking that, I'm turning away from it, and now I'm turning to God. That's what repentance is. It's both a gift from God and it's an active response of obedience. And that's what we see uh, the psalmist doing in verse 2. 
So we repent of our sin. How else do we develop a steadfast heart? Number three, you have to reframe your problems into praise. Okay, this is a mind shift here. You've got to change your thinking. Reframe your problems into praise. Look there at, at verse 3 with me. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. See, even amidst the problems, there is praise that is due God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. See, there's a dramatic mind shift that takes place there. It's just like uh, James chapter 1 in verse 2, where he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Man, that sounds like crazy talk, right? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or endurance, but let patience or endurance have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And guess what? In the story of, the, of Pilgrim's Progress, we see that exact work happening in Christian's life where he makes it up out of the swamp of, of despair only to face his next challenge successfully because he's already got one under his belt. Reframe your problems into praise. Number four, the fourth way that we're going to develop a steadfast heart that can defeat discouragement is you've got to renew your mind in God's truth. Renew your mind in God's truth. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our minds? Through God's map, his book, the Bible that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, look at our, our text, chapter 40, verse 4 is where we pick up. It, said, it says, Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud. Now, that can be translated a couple different ways here. I want to try to give you the sense of what it means to respect the proud. Okay, it, it means to turn to the exalted, it's the, the, the cultural um, expert, uh, the person that we might look to, uh, maybe, it's a, maybe it's some kind of doctor, maybe it's um, some kind of cultural voice on social media, maybe it's a political pundit, maybe it's someone from the psychological community, somebody that's exalted as an expert. See, he's saying, don't trust in that, don't trust in them, instead trust in the Lord. Okay, nor... Such as turn aside to lies. So discern here what's truth and what's error. How do we do that? By renewing our mind in, in God's truth. So what discourages you? I can tell you that one of the things that discourages me, based on that verse in, in verse 4 there, one of the things that discourages me is when I try to be somebody else. You know, it, one of the things that's made it challenging to be a pastor is the availability in our information age, the accessibility of celebrity pastors. You all have access to the greatest preachers in the world on YouTube and podcasts. And every week when we get into this pulpit, we feel like we have to measure up to them. Because we know that you're listening to them, you're hearing them, you're seeing them. I can't measure up to that. Not even Pastor Shirk can measure up to that. <laughs> here's, what I have to, here's what I have to understand and I have to bring my heart back to. That God has given me, he's designed me to be and to do exactly what he's called me to be and to do. And that's the space in which I have to live. Now, here's the truth that I have to tell myself from the, the text, okay? We talked about the lies that it mentions at the end of verse 4. What's the truth that we have to counter that comparison trap with? Well, we see it in, uh, in verse 11, where he says, Do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness, this is God's love toward me in action, let your loving kindness uh, and your truth continually preserve me. I've got to come back to the reality, okay, God loves me for who I am. He doesn't love me more the more I become like so-and-so celebrity pastor. That's not how God's love works. That's a lie. I don't doubt that you struggle with the comparison trap, too. I know being a pastor doesn't make me unique from the rest of humanity. 
This is a trap that we all struggle with. And man, is it a discouraging one. You know, another source of discouragement for me is trying to live up to other people's expectations, but neglecting God's appointed limitations. I try to live up to other people's expectations for me, and I ignore the limits that God has given to me as a person. And so, I'll, man, when I'm trying to be everything and do everything that I can for people, because if, if I only just said it just like this, or if I only knew enough, if I could only package it this way, this would result in life change. If I only invested more in this person or in this group or could do more, spend more time, give more, be more, God would do more. Nope, that, that's not how this works. Not at all. That's a lie, and that is worldly wise man's course to destruction and discouragement. Well, another thing that discourages me is, is listening to the wrong voices. And holy cow, our world is just getting noisier and noisier. We, we are just inundated with voices from all kinds of sources of influence. So evaluate who are you really listening to? Okay, when it comes to social media and, and all of these other venues, that was Christian's challenge in the Pilgrim's Progress when he encountered Mr. Worldly Wise Man. And he listened to his voice instead of his book. We had Jim and Diane Bouton with us last weekend, and uh, they were up here looking for a place to, to relocate and uh, so they stayed at our house, and they have a little dog named Walter. <laughs> and Walter, I wish you could see this dog. I, I thought about putting a, a picture of him up here, but it might affect you in adverse ways. <laughs> Don't tell Jim and Diane we're having this discussion. <laughs> Wally, he, he's a cute little guy. Um, 15 years old, this little dog. Blind and deaf. I mean, this dog, he can't do anything on his own. So a couple times, you know, Jim or Diane would put him in our yard. And our yard is not big, and it's totally fenced in. And somehow Wally would get lost in our backyard. And he begins to get nervous and shake, and he can't quite bark. He's too old to bark. I don't know what you call the sound that he emits from his mouth. It's not a bark. But as soon as Jim or Diane speak, as deaf as this dog is... He is tuned in to Jim and Diane's voice. He doesn't hear anything else. Man, I thought to myself, like, that's exactly how I, I need to live my life like Wally. Just listening to God's voice and blocking everything else out. I could speak to Wally, my kids, my wife, they could speak to Wally to no avail. Doesn't care. He only listens to Jim and Diane. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17 says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guards that you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. There it is in the word of God. Renew your mind in God's truth. Whose voices are you listening to? Well, number five, fifth way that we're going to develop a steadfast heart that can defeat discouragement is you've got to rehearse what God has done. Look with me at verse five in Psalm chapter 40. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they're more than can be numbered. You have to rehearse what God has done. Maybe that means uh, recording what God has done in a thankful journal, where you just take a, a couple minutes at the end of the day to record a couple things that God did even in the course of the day. See, that helps you to reframe your problems into praise, and it helps you to renew your mind in God's truth, rehearsing what God has done. Number six, six way to develop a steadfast heart that defeats discouragement, you have to redirect your energy. Redirect your energy. Look at verse six, the shift that takes place here. He says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. Verse 8, here's the shift. I delight to do your will. Oh, my God. It's not about him, and it's not about the, the swamp of despair. It's not about his problems. It's about his obedience to God. And we see now that his, his heart is beginning to be redirected from being pointed inward at himself and the focus being on himself and it being redirected outward. 
and your law is within my heart. Verse 9, how does that get manifested in his life? We see his life becomes about others rather than just himself. He says, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. No, I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. He's proclaiming it now. See, a life focused on self is a life lived in the wrong direction, especially if you claim to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Because that's the path of worldly wise men that will pay, take you to places that you deeply regret. One of the worst wrong turns is focusing on myself. Corey Tenboom said that if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at God, you'll be at rest. You know, there's a place that I wanted to show you that um, is, is actually special to me on this map um, because of the memories that I have there. And, and one stands out as particularly dramatic. Uh, we needed to, my youth pastor and I, back when I was a, a teenager and um, was a senior in high school getting ready to go to college, we had to set out early. We had to split from the rest of the group because he needed to get me back so that I could be on my way for my very first day of Bible college. We set off on, um, this is the, the, what you're looking at is the north arm of Lake Opiango, the largest lake in Algonquin Provincial Park. And we set out early in the morning and there is a dense fog settled all over the water and you cannot see the landscape and you need to be able to see the landscape to navigate and chart your path to be able to match it to the, the map. Well, we paddled for hours and hours and we end up in this swamp with all these switchbacks and it's you know one step forward and two steps backward and winding and twisting. And we think we're in one place on the map when in reality we're in an altogether different place but didn't realize that till we got to the end of this swamp, which is illustrated on the map by that big, dark, green region on your left. And I don't know if you can see this or not, but this swamp has a name. There's a creek that meanders back and forth through this swamp, and the map doesn't give justification to just how dramatic the landscape here is. But can you see the name of the creek? That was where we lived. Ugh. Creek. Maybe you're spending time right now paddling the creek of ugh. Because, man, when we got to the end of that and realized that we had spent half a day wasted when we needed to be somewhere, that was massively discouraging. So we're just floating there in our canoe trying to figure out where to go. Where did we go wrong? I think we're in Ugg Creek. Yeah, that is for sure. Maybe that's where you're at right now, and you've got to redirect your energy. Because taking a wrong turn can be massively discouraging, can it? Well... Number seven in our, in our text. If you're going to develop a steadfast heart that defeats discouragement, sometimes you have to recruit help. Okay, if you look at verse 13 here, it says, Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Look down at, at verse 17. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. I don't know what the source of discouragement may be this morning for you or what that swamp of despair may look like in your, help, but in your life, but I want you to know that there is hope and help. That the Lord Jesus Christ is right there extending an, a hand to be your help, to lift you up out of that swamp of despair. And not only that, you, you have us. You have Grace Baptist Church. We have a counseling ministry here at Grace with people who are equipped to help you through your swamp of despair, no matter how deep, no matter how messy, and we would count it a privilege to do so. We're going to be gearing up over the course of the summer to get ready to launch community groups once again in September. Man, those can be a great source of encouragement and help for you in developing a steadfast heart. So I hope that you'll have that on your radar and that you'll consider signing up once we get to the fall. But there is hope and help available to you right now. All you've got to do, just like Christian did in the swamp of despair, is respond. Please pray with me. 
Father, we're tremendously thankful for the resources that you have blessed us with in the course of our journey, and what a dangerous journey it is. None of us can ever anticipate the, the twists and setbacks and turns that our, life, our lives take upon the way. Some of them are our fault. And some of them are not. They're by your design. And so, Father, I would pray for those who might find themselves in the swamp of despair this morning, that they would respond to the help that only you can offer that you would steer them away from the voices of our culture, away from the voices of all of the worldly wise men that would seek to speak into their life and tell them how to handle their burden of sin and tell them how they can have hope and how they can know the truth and blah, blah, blah. That they would have a tuned ear toward your word. So God, help us to be in your book, following your map for life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And if you joined us online, we're tremendously grateful that you were with us this morning as well. We hope that you have a phenomenal rest of your day, great week. We're looking forward to being together again next week. You are not dismissed, you are sent. Have a great day. Amen.